Welcome back. Um, here we are, almost everybody. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed some good Norwegian for Kacha. Um, it's one of the specialties up here in Buda. Um, before the break, I promised you uh, to say something about the Arctic Congress 2024. I hope you checked out the stand. Just as a small little first glimpse of next year, the Heinov Dialogue will be a bit later, so we hope for some nicer weather. It will be end of May, early June, when not only the Heinov Dialogue 2024 will happen, but also the U Arctic University of the Arctic Congress, as well as the International Congress of Arctic Social Sciences 2024. So we have a full week of um, Arctic Congress, let's call it, we call it that way, Arctic Congress 2024. And also Mats Fredriksen said he will bring all the Arctic Economic Council folks to Bude, you know. He promised me yesterday, I haven't talked to Frude, but... Uh, as well, Bude will be the, the European capital uh, for, of culture, so a lot will happen next year, but that's still a year ahead. We t it's today, why we're here. Um, app, has everybody downloaded the app? Reminder, questions about the app, uh, as well as we have the young or the Heino of Young Entrepreneur competition uh, before we end today's session, after this uh, session now. And you can only vote for the Young Heino uh, of Young Entrepreneur via the app. So please download the app and I will explain more on the voting after uh, this next session, which will be moderated by Leif Monika Stupold, which is a, who is a partner at the law firm in Oslo. Leif Monika, it's great to have you back in the Arctic. Um, space opportunity, no, space of opportunities in businesses. It's what you want to talk about with your panelists. So I look forward to the conversation and thank you very much. Well, thank you. And um, delighted to be here at High North Dialogue. Frode, you got uh, the well-deserved credit from the Prime Minister earlier today. So I'll simply echo that. And delighted to see the collaboration during the day with the University of Business and government officials. So, dear students, ex-students, future students, we're all in it for the long run, and nobody can hope uh, that we are already done with learning new things. So that's why the focus on education and student roles is so helpful, and it's also a reminder that a number of us that have been around the block a few times really need to learn uh, new stuff. So today uh, we will uh, share with you a session on business opportunities, the space for opportunities. There are a lot of issues, there are clouds we didn't have before, there are obstacles, but there are also doors opening and there are also dynamics that shift. And there is one thing that mark business and that is their ability to adapt to shifting um, framework conditions, to adapt to shifting risks, and to try to understand what is going on. But today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a panel that is also experienced in the interface between public and private sector, and that is crucial. Because if we don't succeed in this, I would say, meta time of change, um, then uh, the only way to do so safely, uh, robustly, sustainably, is for government and industry to really understand and know each other. So I look forward now to introduce to you uh, a keynote speaker, but I will tell you uh, the structure of this session so you know what you're in for. Uh, after I introduce our keynote speaker, she will uh, present, and then I have asked the panelists to have uh, a small introduction on the issues at hand, and they will then circulate and come up, give a presentation, sit down, followed by a panel with everyone, and then saving them just to sit and wait and uh, be watched while they're listening to the others. So that's how we'll do the practicalities. We have gotten, ladies and gentlemen, the very best keynote speaker imaginable, Tara Sweeney. Um, she has been... Start getting up, Tara, a proven record of effective leadership. 
and somebody that really marries understanding public sector and government and industry and the necessities of capital and the necessities of creating new business. Tara, we're so delighted you're here. You've been part of government. You have not the least been the first international chair of Arctic Economic Council, which is really an important organization that we will hear more about. The floor is yours. <clears throat> in the back, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you to the organizers of the High North Dialogue for the invitation to participate in this discussion. In many respects, Norway is like a sister state to Alaska. There are similarities between our environments, resources, and communities. We have larger population centers, sparse rural communities, great geographic expanse, indigenous communities that are part of the fabric of our identities, challenging climates, resource development, and rich and vibrant histories and traditions. I'm a child of rural Alaska, and my perspectives and my practices are shaped by those experiences, and they're enhanced by others. I am from Utkarvik, the northernmost community in the United States. I grew up on the cusp of oil development on Alaska's North Slope. I had the opportunity to experience the transition from a honey bucket to a flush toilet by the age of 16. The oceans, oil, gas, critical minerals, and renewable potential are some of the ties that bind together the circumpolar Arctic. As I've stated in other venues, our communities have come to realize and accept that our survival depends on a healthy natural environment and responsible resource development. 35 years ago, the North Slope had substandard housing, no piped water or sewer services, leaking bulk fuel storage facilities, and little to no health services for our residents. The world has since changed. Our communities recognize they are on the front lines of Arctic development and carry some of the highest risks with respect to food security, and cultural and environmental impacts. The regional leadership is ever vigilant to ensure that any potential weak links are, have been sufficiently addressed. There is a strong focus on understanding the tensions dynamic and striking a delicate balance between resource development and environmental protection. In my home region, this is a favored approach because we don't want to become sideline observers to development that occurs in our backyard. Through active engagement, we continue to ensure that our communities have basic necessities, like police and fire protection, local schools, running water, health clinics, and that we can keep our families fed. While there are many, many projects that are proposed throughout the Arctic, success is only realized when our communities are brought into the process earlier rather than later or when required. Everyone benefits when there is a broader understanding of a project's effects on the people, the environment, and communities. Now, as I contemplated the panel topic, it became clear to me that we still have a lot of work to do to realize true progress in the Arctic. As we consider leadership for the future, we must challenge the status quo. Just because it has always been done this way does not mean it will work tomorrow. We also need to push for innovation. A region absent of innovation will remain stagnant and thus left behind. Further, as geopolitical tensions rise, we must place a higher value on collaboration and bringing people together. If the Arctic is to truly remain a region of peace, 
We must reject tactics that escalate fears and myopic approaches to our very complex challenges. Instead, we should focus on engagement that provides opportunities for stakeholders to come to these forthcoming debates. And finally, we should consider approaches that are solutions-oriented, data-driven, and free from hyperbole and conjecture. So what do we need? There are certain elements that are needed as a precursor to support sustainable activities, business activities in the Arctic. First and foremost, we need to dig deep. Let's promote meaningful dialogue focused on discussing the natural tensions between natural resource extraction and our collective demand on those resources. A desire to shift to a greener economy, the role of critical minerals mining to support that type of economy, and climate-driven engagements. And finally, the need for stakeholder engagement throughout all of these discussions. Over the years, I've made many observations. And from my observations, the following tactics don't work. A patronizing government approach, haste, pressures driven by financial deadlines, attitudes that drive the check the box mentality, ENGOs working to save the natives, the expectation that indigenous voices are homogenous, an unwillingness to understand or cooperate, and regulatory red tape. Those tactics, they don't work. But here are tactics that I've observed that do work. A respected seat at the table, good faith efforts to protect subsistence resources, indigenous enterprise development, and partnership agreements, like conflict avoidance agreements, good neighbor policies, and revenue sharing. So to the Sami representatives in the room, does it make sense to have cross-border collaboration efforts between the Alaska Native communities and Sami? We, we share a history of supporting each other. Is it time to make new connections around potential development projects? Let us begin a more transparent and substantive dialogue on an adaptive Arctic economy. If we do not develop our own economic and climate-focused policies, non-Arctic interests will define those terms for us. It is equally important to communicate why we need a more collaborative, substantive, and transparent approach to business in the Arctic. Current economic models focus on high rates of financial return in the shortest amount of time. If we continue to use this metric as the only indicator of success, we may see Arctic investments constrained and thus lag in progress. Let us drive behaviors and outcomes with a focus on patient capital. Let us promote a more accurate narrative about the Arctic, not the romantic snow globe desired by outsiders. The EU is the champion of the, the global urgency for the green transition. That urgency has an impact on and a clear role for the Arctic. This is why we need a pan-Arctic economic policy to ensure any shift in our energy portfolio development happens on our terms. So how do we get what we need to create the spaces of business opportunities for the Arctic. First, let's create spaces for solutions, oriented discussions that aim to provide a substantive focused exchange, a series of curated discussions focused on truly an adaptive Arctic economy. Can we learn from each other? Second, I again challenge you to develop a thoughtful metric that drives patient capital investment in the Arctic. Can we weight a factor for a social rate of return when calculating the internal rate of return? Can we design a system that drives behavior to reward or promote these types of investments? Third, 
Businesses need clarity and stability. The Arctic region is in a global competition for investment dollars. If we cannot demonstrate that the Arctic is a stable region for business, those investment opportunities will go to regions south with more predictable and certain regulatory regimes. And finally, utilizing conferences like the High North Dialogue, Arctic Economic Council, Arctic Frontiers, Arctic Encounters Symposium, to make declarations of support for Arctic-specific policies to be presented to the Arctic parliamentarians or to the Arctic Council as a guide. Let us be more conscious with how we share our recommendations for Arctic policy with our political leaders. Let us become advocates for policies that incentivize business growth and investments in the Arctic. It takes an investment of time, building of trust, and effectively communicating with residents to get communities invested into certain projects. There are ways to get all parties to the table working towards a win-win scenario. Join me in advocating for responsible economic development and smarter policies for the benefit and betterment of the Arctic region and its people. We have many to educate and much to do to continue to progress life forward in our region. And while it can appear like a daunting task, if we work together, we can create the space for business opportunities that showcase the best of all the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tara, for those inspiring words. We will now uh, move on to a presentation from Arctic Economic Council Executive Direct Director, uh, Mats Quist Fredriksen, and Arctic Economic Council has already been introduced. You are its second Executive Director, succeeding the excellent Arne Fredriksson, who headed it for the first six years. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. And for the next seven minutes, I will uh, speed talk you through a little bit about the opportunities in the Arctic region and why innovation is so important that we don't only have the natural resources. So this map, I will get back to at the end of the presentation, but for me, this map really symbolizes what Arctic business is all about. So remember this map. So let's first go up in the helicopter. Let's look at the global challenges. We know that we have a challenge of climate change. And in the Arctic, it happens at four times the speed as anywhere else. In Svalbard, it's seven times the global average. So that's the challenge that the whole globe is facing. We also have this challenge that we're going to be a lot more people on this planet in the future. We invented fertilizers around the 1900, and suddenly we went from less than 2 billion to more than 8 billion today, and we will be 9.7 billion people in 2050. These people need energy. These people need uh, food to eat. And most of them, they don't live in the Arctic region yet, at least. We're just 4 million people. So what can we do in the Arctic region that will benefit those people living inside of this circle? So let me give you the solution. Fish to feed the world. That's one thing that built Arctic societies and is still building Arctic communities. This is from Greenland. This is Royal Greenland. Fishing in Greenland is 95% of their export. 95% of export is from the fishing industry, so that's a lot of employment. Most jobs are inside in the fishing industry. And also, here you can add a little bit of innovation because there's a fish all around the world, but what we have in the Arctic is sustainable fishing, but we also have the Northern Light. And you might say, what does that have to do with the fish? In South Korea, the customers are willing to pay a premium from fish that has been caught under the Northern Light. So suddenly here we have a little bit of marketing and we have a great product. We also have this product, which I think is great. This is fish skin from the codfish. This is from the company Carisys in Iceland. They used to throw away this fish skin for many years until an uh, Icelandic guy in a small fishing community of 2,500 people sold they were just throwing away food, and we don't throw away food in the Arctic. So he decided to make a pharmaceutical product. Today, this skin, the skin of the fish, is worth more money than the fillet of the cod. So this is full utilization of the product. Don't throw anything away. Let's move from the fishing into energy, because that's another thing we have in the Arctic. Oil and gas really build up a lot of the Arctic 
throughout the world and is still a major part of, for example, Alaska, uh, as we heard about earlier. But we also have a lot of other in energy sources. We have renewable energy, and this is a small fishing community close to where I live. And the company Tromskraft has recently installed the largest battery in Norway. It's uh, located in this small fishing community in partnership with the University of Tromsø. And what they want to do is they want to say, let's create stable energy for this fishing community. Let's, let's make sure that we compromise. We don't have perfect infrastructure in the north, so this can, uh, can help deliver better infrastructure with, these, uh, um, with this battery. So we have renewable energy, we have oil and gas to power industries. And then that also means that suddenly companies are putting up data centers in the north. This woman, this is Moa. Moa is an amazing startup woman. What she has decided to say, everyone is building data centers in the north, but there's a lot of energy just being wasted, a lot of heat dis disappearing. So this she said, why don't we put vertical farming next to these data centers so we can now grow our own letters in the north using the energy from the data centers. And then just to say, you know, I know there's more, more of the Arctic than just the Nordic Arctic. So a lot of uh, communities, especially in North America, are not connected to the grid. Those are fly-in, fly-out communities. This is from Canada, this is Old Crow, and Old Crow is a small community of around 700 people, and they used to always be reliant on fly-in diesel. So diesel would be flown in, dropped off, and the generators would be running. A few years ago, they installed solar panels. Now they cut their energy uses by 25%, or not the energy use, the same energy use, but they cut the use of diesel with 25%. And for the first time in the history of this community, there is absolute silence because there's no generators going on in the background anymore. This is a great example that when we talk about energy, it's not only you know, what we have in the north, uh, it's also small remote communities. And then, for me, personally, the most exciting business opportunity we have right now, and now a lot of you will feel you're going back to class, this is super important. And it's important because of those minerals that are highlighted here. Those minerals are the ones you need in the green transition. Actually, you also need them for oil and gas production, you need it for all kinds of energy production, you need raw materials. But the question is, where do we get our raw materials from today? Let's look where the European Union get their raw materials from. So you can see the European Union currently right now is getting 99% of their rare earth elements from China. They get 68% of their cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they could get all of this from the Arctic region as well. We got rare earth elements, we got cobalt, we got titanium, we got nickel, we got a lot of things. This is an opportunity because we also got good long-term framework conditions, stable framework conditions. So it's, it's a better place if you care about sustainability, if you care about CSR, look up north. And then a good example of this is this town. Now we are in northern Sweden. This is Kiruna. They have been doing mining for 130 years. And what you see on, on the right-hand side is the current iron mine. That's the iron deposit that they have been running for 130 years. On the left-hand side, you see the largest deposit of rare earth elements in Europe. That is in the Arctic part of Sweden. That is an immense opportunity to succeed with this. It will just take us 20 years because there's a lot of permitting to be done and a lot of investments and a lot of technology, but there's a massive potential in LKAB in northern Sweden. But they are not stopping there. LKAB in northern Sweden is making the largest private investment in the history of Sweden. It's taking place in the Arctic, in the Swedish Arctic. They are using hydrogen to try to make uh, fossil-free steel, and they are actually succeeding in making better quality steel with high using hydrogen. I think this is an amazing project. It also shows the private sector taking a massive responsibility, uh, saying, you know, if we operate in the north, we need to do it in a responsible manner. So that was all the beautiful part of the story. Obviously, it's not that easy because we got three challenges. Challenge number one, we got the infrastructure challenge. You know, infrastructure is roads and ports and airports, but it's also building schools and, and building the infrastructure. Especially when it comes to energy, we need to be better at being able to transport energy from the north to the south or to other places. So one thing is we got an infrastructure challenge. Second, and this is related, we need investments. I think I put up this project as an example. This is a subsea fiber optic cable running from Japan all the way up to North Norway and Ireland. This is actually to get traders trading online, is to get their traders more efficient. 
but it will benefit all the communities you see along the line because they will suddenly have access to uh, fiber optic internet. So suddenly we are connecting the unconnected. This is a massive investment, and this investment will not come from the Arctic region. That will come from outside the Arctic region. So we need investments, infrastructure investments. And then the biggest challenge of them all, when I speak with all the member companies of the Arctic Economic Council, the biggest challenge is, uh, is people, qualified workforce. We need more young people that we have been hear hearing about all day, and we need them to work uh, in the north, because there's plenty of business opportunities in the north. We just, need, uh, we just need them to come here. So let's get back to this one. This map, for me, is the most interesting map when it comes to Arctic business, because this map is 1,200 years old and shows the trading routes, the trading routes 1,200 years ago. This is the Vikings sailing from Norway over to Iceland over to Greenland, did the marketing stunt of calling it Greenland, uh, and went over to Vineland. So trading in the Arctic has been happening for more than a thousand years. It's not a new thing to do business in the Arctic. And what the reason why people moved to the north was because of the business opportunities. It was because of the jobs here in the fishing industry, in the oil and gas sector, in the mining sector. That's why people decided to move to the north. And when it comes to innovation, these indigenous people in Greenland that the Vikings met, they discovered that the first rain jacket in the world was actually developed in Greenland. So this is a lightweight rain jacket. And I'll get into the final slide now, which is the Arctic innovation slide. So we have natural advantages. We have fish, we have energy, um, we have mining, and we have the technology. But what we need now is ideas and execution. We need people to come up with this innovation, and then we get value and we get competitiveness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mats, and thank you very much for bringing up innovation. Uh, it's such a crucial element in uh, understanding the opportunities, because if we uh, think we can only use the existing tools, it's hard to see obstacles, but we will be developing new tools as well. And I think you, Knut Ida Larsen, who will now present to us from Equino, will also be a representative of a company that has always been very keen on innovation. Of course, everybody knows Equino, the biggest company in Northern Europe, basically, and indeed the biggest company on the Norwegian continental shelf. But your job is Vice President Operations uh, Baron C, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Thank you for your... <laughs> thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation as, uh, as well. Uh, I've been living in, uh, in the Arctic my whole life. I actually also took my education here in Buda, so it's, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, but I've also been working related to the ocean my whole professional career, but also enjoying the mountains in my spare time and uh, enjoying that very much. So since 2006, I joined uh, Equinor, and it's, I must say it's a privilege to be working in Equinor and really proud of uh, the last 12 months when we have been contributing significantly to uh, Europe with energy as the single most important provider of energy. Uh, the company has ambitions and target to be net zero in 2050. That's a quite an ambitious target. It includes scope three emissions so, and we have launched a transformation plan in order to achieve that. And that strategy is based on three pillars. It's to optimize the oil and gas business, to reduce the emission by 50% within 2030. And that will mainly be done by electrification of the asset at the, the shelf. And then it's a, to, the second lead point is to develop a uh, material position within offshore wind. And the third point in the strategy is to develop new value chains. And based on emission-free energies. So that will be such as hydrogen, ammonia, and with uh, CCS. But electrification is kind of key in the start in order to uh, implement and reach the 50% reduction in emissions. And that is important not just for us as an industry, that is also very important for Norway as a nation in order to uh, reach the national goals. 
So, but at the same time as it is challenges uh, to do so, uh, due to lack of uh, local power and infrastructure, uh, especially in the north. So that is a challenge we have to, to address. But the energy transition uh, is important, of high importance also for uh, energy security, but also the energy transition of Europe. We will therefore invest more than half our, our investment going forward. From 2030, we say that half of the investment and will be related to renewables and new value chains. This provides a clear guide on how we should uh, come to, uh, to the end game related to sustaining the value creation from uh, the Norwegian continental shelf and the company as a, in totality with progressively lower emissions. So in, 20, in 2030, as I said, 50% reduction in the emissions and in 2050, we should be net zero. That is the, that is the goal. But this is only possible by our starting position. That's the only thing we have to build. We have to build on the competence uh, built in the company the last 50 years. And that goes for uh, people's competence. It's go for the marine and offshore uh, experience, technology, uh, infrastructure, onshore and offshore and also the existing business that creates cash flow in order to do the transformation. And also the suppliers, suppliers in the north and suppliers that has also uh, been with us globally in our operations in 30 countries. But also new employees and new competences. So the Arctic is a very important uh, region for us. One third of Equinor's gas production uh, to Europe comes from this region. One third, uh, and a large part of uh, a large part of the investment going forward for this decade will be in this region. And we've been present here for 40 years, and we will be present here for for many decades to, to come. We operate Osta Hanstein that provides gas to the UK, but also Snøvit in Hammerfest that provides LNG to Europe, mostly to Europe uh, uh, currently. And then we will have Johan Kasberg, a new oil fail in the Barents uh, at stream next uh, year, according to our plans. But in order to do so, we need a skilled workforce. We, we have about 1,000 employees in, uh, in northern Norway currently, and we are growing, so we need more competence in order to, uh, to achieve our goals. The three key factors uh, for our operations forward, going forward is, first and foremost, no harm to the environment. Secondly, good cooperation. Good cooperation with business, cluster collaboration, that is also why we contributed in establishing uh, Energy in Ur, together with uh, Varangerkraft, Mo Industri Park, uh, Tromskraft, uh, Polarbase, uh, and Arctic Energy Partners. So that is why we, we will need to collaborate in order to achieve our goals going forward. The, the third point is coexistence with other sectors especially uh, fisheries related to the ocean. Uh, and in Norway, we got a really good regulation, we think, related to uh, the ocean areas. It's regulated to the our ecosystem approach, our management, management plans. And that is a good uh, way of doing that all activities are assessed and, and the region is closely monitored on that, uh, in that plans. So the management plan systems uh, with the clarification of the vulnerable areas uh, is setting the framework for our activities. So that is a really good starting point. To summarize, uh, we have seen a lot of opportunities with large industry projects going forward in, uh, in the north. Uh, but to succeed, we need predictable uh, framework from the regulatory 
and we need high environmental standards, and we need uh, the coexistence and cooperation to function well. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for reminding us of the helpfulness of having a good planning strategy for how we deal with ocean management. I'm now delighted to introduce our next speaker, Jan Arve Haugan. He is currently the COO of Freyr, a battery uh, industry initiative that will be uh, manufacturing batteries in uh, the high north in the future. He has a long track record from uh, Körner, Rocco Solutions, Hydro, but now very focused on the energy transition. Please. Thanks a lot, uh, Limonika, and uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here in uh, Bodø again. Um, as uh, my dialect is obviously not suiting perfect to talk about football, so I'm going to skip that today. My name is Jan Arve Haugan, and I come from Trøndelag. So uh, for those of you who uh, follow that, uh, that's a different story. Uh, I, as uh, Limonika said, I'm the chief operating officer, and I'm here uh, stepping in because Tom uh, Jensen, who is our CEO, he actually uh, is still in Germany. He signed an agreement with Siemens yesterday, so he's not going to be here today. But I will try to do uh, the, uh, the, the, doing the substitute here today. So um, on the pictures uh, which you see here now, it's a picture from the 13th of April, and it's our facilities in Muirana, which is now currently being uh, constructed. And just before Easter, we also marked the, the could say the completion of the installation of the equipment in our customer qualification plant. It's a pilot line which we have now introduced as a, as a documenting that we are able to industrialize this new technology. And for those of you who are familiar with the construction industry, uh, it is what we call uh, a party for everybody that also have uh, done their construction work. And of course, the basic background from, for Freyer, which is, of course, a startup, started in 2018, but listed on the New York Stock Exchange in 2021, is we saw that the Swedes were able to do it in Nordvolt in Skellefteå. So, you know, as a good competitor in the Nordic region here, we saw that the Swedes are going to do it. Okay, then we'll try to do it even better. So that was a key uh, driver for our startup. So what I'm going to do here today, I'm going to divide this into three, and I also try to do it as quick as my former speaker here, uh, or talker. Uh, the three elements that I'm going to address is, of course, to talk a little bit about the Freyr, what are we doing today, and then a little bit about what we are realizing as we speak, and then, of course, what do we see as, uh, as challenges going forward. Freya today, we are a startup. As I said, we came into, if you say, uh, an idea back in 2018. Industrial leaders came together, met and started to discuss, okay, what can we do together? Uh, very important uh, support at that time was actually both from, from Sintef and from the university in Trondheim. But also, the, it was very urge, er, early uh, recommendation to go to Moirana because of the industrial culture. And that's why we have already established ourselves in Moirana. We are today an organization that has, first of all, got a license uh, from a spin-off of MIT in Boston. It's called 24M Technology. And we are currently building an organization and we are building the, this pilot plant, which I now briefly will talk a little bit about, and the Gigafactory. But we are starting to build, could you say, to be a startup that moves from a PowerPoint company and into a real industrial company. If I then very quickly, of every, everybody who talks about batteries, they are thinking about the car batteries or the electrical vehicle batteries. That's the that's the volume, that's the, what do you say, the sexy part. We are more addressing the energy storage, energy service. And I think I saw your picture here about the battery that you now talked about in Troms. And this is typically examples that we are 
focusing on. The technology and the production system are perfectly suited for that. Obviously, mobility is also uh, a very interesting opportunity. We have already made an agreement with one of the uh, battery producers or battery uh, manufacturers for uh, buses and, of course, ferries and boats. So we do see this as an opportunity, and I do think that the combination or the hybrid between batteries and hydrogen is obviously one of the green possibilities going forward for mobility. Just very quickly, this is what we think you can see in the future going forward. It's already an industry, but this is a solar farm or a wind energy farm, and in order to frequency modulate that, and to be able to have stable production into the grid, they need battery farms. And typically, this is a, an, a, could you say a sketch showing a battery farm. It's a number of 20-foot containers, this case here, 108 C, eight of them, at a total of 350 megawatt, of megawatt hours. And that should then be sufficient for a decently big uh, wind farm or a solar farm. If I then address the topic of, okay, what are we approaching now? And I think that there's a combination of the, probably the best word I'd, or the quickest word I could use there is deglobalization. We see that the customers are looking more for regionalized production capacity and also the value chain. So when we ask Rista Energy, uh, uh, a consultant that are monitoring the different uh, developments of, of energy, they indicate that the volumes of batteries that are needed in the European market is growing very rapidly, globally and, and of course, uh, European market. And we also see that the EV market, and in particular when you look at uh, industry in the Europe, which is now competing with the Far East and Chinese production systems, they are extremely dependent on batteries coming in from, 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 uh, from regions, in, like in Europe. And what we have put together here is a, sh is a picture showing that, okay, how many battery parks of giga size do we need in order to meet this demand? And of course, so we really don't see any of our, could you say, competitors as real competitors. We really support everybody that are able to m build capacity in the market. So what we have said as our key, dom uh, could you say, common denominator, that we need to have the speed in order to meet the market. We need to have the scale in order to reduce the cost per unit, obviously. But we also do strongly realize that the sustainability or the lowest possible CO2 footprint is extremely important. So we have promoted strongly that clean energy and a very, very low CO2 footprint from the production is a key feature. And I also realize that I can market them now as they are produced under the green light, so that's probably, I can have an uplift on that one. So what we have done now, we have built our plant in, in Muirana. In, it's, a, it's a brownfield, so we actually got hold of a uh, uh, facility that was used to uh, coat the pipeline from Osterhansten and down to Nyhamna. So it's an oil and gas industry. We got that uh, building and we installed a full-size production line into, into that facility. And then up at the central Tomta, very close to the, to the iron, uh, iron uh, factory, we have now started the foundations and the construction of the gigafactory. I said that we just had a sort of party where we did an opening of the customer qualification plant. The customer qualification plant is, as I said, a full-size uh, construction uh, or uh, production line of the semi-solid battery technology. This was decided seven days after we got listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and we have, that was the summer of 2021. And now we are ready to the startup and later the ramp up of the production facility. This document is of, this is to document our production capacity and to be able to document to our customers that this is what we are producing. I just want to complete now, uh, Leo Monica, by saying that okay, the Giga Arctic 
is moving ourselves from a PowerPoint line and a demonstration pipe uh, uh, production line and into a full-size uh, facility. We have already spent 3 billion Norwegian kroner in the facility, and this is really so. We are not only talking about it, we see the opportunities in the space, and we're actually doing it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Arve Haugan. And um, I would now like to move to our next speaker, Guru Bransaug. She is the development director of Varanger Kraft. And uh, she joined in October uh, last year. And uh, um, uh, Varanger Kraft is, of course, headquartered in uh, Vatsö, but um, the whole East Finnmark has, of course, a close um, relationship to the uh, power supplier, and I welcome Guru to present. Please. Thank you, Monica. I've been asked to give a perspective of business development in the North, both the potentials, but also the challenges. My perspective is, as uh, Monica said, from Varange Kraft, a small but complete power company situated in the eastern part of Finnmark by the border between Norway, NATO, and Russia. I will also present a personal perspective, both as a citizen and as a local politician dedicated to a positive development in this region. First of all, the North is an area with access to, to rich natural resources, and opportunities are undoubtedly that we all are familiar with and agree on. In a great extent, development in the North is, is both positively and in challenging, challenging ways connected to value creation from these natural resources. A value creation that, that, that demands another kind of resources, human resources human resources that we are lacking more of every day, especially here in the North. Living on the border of Russia, we face this challenge even more. In a region said to be of strategical importance, people are now moving on a scale we have never experienced before. This is, in my opinion, the greatest challenge of them all, for the development of both business and sustainable living, but also for safety and security policy. Facing the lack of human resources, we must, as many have already mentioned today, create a northern region of opportunities and optimism for the youth. And to achieve any strategical objective, we need to gather around agreed strategies with necessary framework and conditions for the develop development. Unfortunately, as with the growing lack of human resources, we also experience growing challenges for the basis of success in, a, in achieving these agreed strategies. I will pinpoint three of these challenges today. First, there is a new security situation in the North with militarization and growing tension. In a great extent, the geopolitical situation of today prevents almost all kind of cross-border business cooperation in the region of, in the eastern part of Finnmark. A cooperation that has been of great importance for many decades. The international sanction policy, policy has already local and regional uh, consequences that prohibit possibilities for industrial and logistical business development in the area. The militarization of the Barents region might provide new business opportunities, but most of all, the growing tension is demanding and, in and, in and inhibiting for future positive development of shared resources and possibilities. Varanger Kraft, the owner of Pasvik Kraft, produces water power from the border river Pasvik Elva. The production accounts for a quarter of the total energy consumption in Finnmark. This is a production completely dependent on cross-border cooperation between Norway, Finland and Russia. A concrete example of our vulnerability in a region of shared res natural resources with mutual dependence. Secondly, as for the South, we experience a present energy crisis in the North. Unlike the South and Norway, this energy crisis is not linked to high prices. 
On the contrary, low prices and a new tax regime are, are some of the challenges for profitable energy production in the North. The most critical, however, is lack of grid capacity, which is essential infrastructure to both ensure sufficient power, power supply and to increase power energy production. The northern regions are predicted in short time to experience an energy deficit if the grid situation is not improved and if the production of energy is not increased. For Finnmark, this situation might already appear in the coming years due to the potential of the electrification of the LNG production on Melkea in Hammerfest. For the eastern part of Finnmark, the situation is even more critical. The, the, there is currently no available grid capacity for new industry, nor for new production. This is a dramatic situation in a strategically important region that needs both restructuring and new development. A region which also represents great national opportunities for green energy production and sustainable extraction of natural resources. Thirdly, we face increased internal tension, tensions between different interests that need to be balanced for acceptable and necessary coexistence. Different and conflicting interests apply to the whole Arctic, but we must be able to rightly, to rightly claim that this, that this applies to Finnmark in particular. Important democratic licensing processes intended to safeguard indigenous people, indigenous rights, environmental cons concerns and other conflicting interests are demanding to carry out in terms of both time and resources. Even more, in most cases, they lead to the opposite of achieving agreed strategies for development. At the same time, the population is decreasing and time to carry out necessary change seems to vanish, while development does not appear. To sum up, the potential of the North is situated in its location and magnitude of natural resources. The development, on the other hand, is depending on the people and the authorities' ability to create sustainable and common strategies and decisions for value creation, geopolitical stability and coexistence. Thank you. Uh, Guru for that presentation of the very special situation uh, that we see in East Finnmark, which I think demonstrates an issue that is uh, also generic in this challenge. Now, I would like to introduce our last speaker before the panel um, is invited to join, and that is Teresa Baike. Please uh, come to the stage. Teresa is the Impact and Benefit Agreement Coordinator uh, with, um, the, um, with the Nunasiavut um, government uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. And you have more than 20 years' experience in managing uh, the uh, implementation of local licenses operate please thank you um, and thank you thank you for the invitation to be here so I am an Inuk who works for New York civic government 20 in 2002 we signed an impact and benefit agreement with valet a global co mining company to so that they could mine nickel in a footprint area just south of one of our most northerly, of our most northerly community. Um, the impact and benefit agreement gives a lot of commitments that the company has to follow. My role with Nunat Silver Government is to ensure that those commitments are being met by both parties, not just the company, but by our government as well. The most important one I think that I will talk about here today is the business opportunities that we signed off on. So when we signed our um, impact and benefit agreement, it gave, the company had to provide opportunities for Inuit businesses. They, when we gave permission, we determine who an Inuit business or what an Inuit business is. And the company, ha if they have any business opportunities, contracting opportunities, then they have to give us notification what the opportunities are, give our businesses opportun uh, first opportunity to bid on those, and if there are businesses that come in under fair market value, 
then they have to look at the, consider them very seriously and oftentimes do have to provide the contract to our Inuit businesses. What it has done as well is um, some of our businesses, of course, had not had the experience in mining, so a lot of our companies formed partnerships, joint ventures with a lot of the larger companies that are either national or global for drilling, for heavy equipment maintenance, for uh, aircraft, and fly in, fly out things, uh, catering, and whatever. And, and just as re I think I, what I forgot to mention is that the Voices Bay mine is in a remote site that is only accessible by sea or air. People that work at the mine site have, uh, and contractors are typically flown in and out. There are no, it's the largest community on the north coast of Labrador that has no children. There's nobody under the age of 18 there. So the opportunity as well for our company is, companies and business development is that they, the companies, our companies, know the people on the coast. They know who's capable of doing the employment. So it, it gave a lot of opportunity for local employment, people that had never worked in industrial sites in areas of high unemployment rates, a um, lot of social assistance and social use of social programs. So now we have approximately 50% of the permanent workforce at the Boise Bay Mine site of over 500 employees are indigenous. And it bring, lends an economic boost to our communities. It gives a boost to the companies because with the companies, one of the opportunities as well, by hiring local people, they're gonna stay. We've actually had people who started work back when the mine actually began who are now starting to retire. And there's less turnover, so the company doesn't have to spend as much money training people. Some of the challenges, and I think like everybody here has mentioned, is the human resources side of it. Because our communities are small, the largest community being approximately 1,200, uh, a population of 1,200 to four other communities that have a pro anywhere from two to 400 populations. There's very few people left that want to work in Voices Bay or in whatever. So, and we have difficulty having the engineers and the higher, some of those more scientific type programs. So the challenge for us is getting those people trained. The challenge for the companies trying to, the companies and the contractors are trying to get these people into work in Voices Bay because it's typically a two weeks in, two weeks out scenario work time. Um, it, so those are some of the challenges and I think the biggest one is that it is a remote site. It's very difficult for them to become a green energy company be, or to become a green company because again, our communities are remote as is Voices Bay. They have to operate by diesel. They're looking at some different options now, such as windmill power. They've done studies on wave power from the ocean, um, and, they've all, and now they're looking to the provincial government because we have one of the largest hydro development projects in our area in Labrador, in Southern, like central Labrador, called Muskrat Falls and also Churchill Falls. But again, the cost is kind of prohibitive, so there needs to be investment, and I think that is one of the biggest challenges facing Valet and some of our communities today, is that cost, the cost of investment and lack of to become more green and to attract people to our communities. And that's, I'm very quick actually, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Theresa. And um, I would like to invite the panel to come up. And I would also uh, like particularly to welcome Shaohi Zong, please, if you could stand. Uh, well, why don't you to come over and stand next to me, please, uh, okay. Shaohi. Um, uh, so I'll just move the two of you around oh, okay. and uh, join me around here. Mm -hmm. um, there we are. All good. Tara, please. 
So um, thank you very much for very uh, good interventions, and you covered a lot of ground. I have to say, there was uh, there was very little repetition, if anything. But I'd like to start with you, uh, mm -hmm. shall we? Because you are a master student, yeah. and you're here on exchange from China, and uh, you've been looking into Arctic issues for your global management study, and I think you've been looking at some local Arctic <laughs> industries as well. So I wanted to put to you the question that we've heard addressed by our panelists, mm -hmm. and that is, what uh, promising possibilities do you think, do you see, as a student and a young person coming into Norway, what promising possibilities do you see in the Arctic? Well, thank you for inviting me to, as a student uh, uh, to give my opinion on that. From my perspective, the two most promising uh, possibilities are the energy industry and smart cities, especially when it comes to the urban planning, the circular economy, and the new energy solutions. I think that Norway and China can a lot from each other, since we all know that both countries have made a lot of useful and important experience about all these kind of things. Yeah, that's what I thought about that. So energy and smart cities, that's a great keyword that we haven't heard mm. uh, earlier in the same way. But of course, the industry would like to understand how do we secure the realization of such promises? Do you have a take on that as well? Oh, I think that from, um, I think that we can secure the business potential through the dialogue and the cooperation on areas where we shared interests and where it is possible. And both Norway and China have come a long way in developing like world leading technologies related to the green transition and the renewable energies. It was very interesting for me to learn, about, learn more about the Feria factory factory during my field trip to the Moriana. And uh, also Chinese corporations such as the Cato Contemporary Apex Technology Limited also work in this field. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, however different their technologies are, they, can, they are both developed to face the same challenge. And in the context of the cooperation and the dialogue, universities will play play a particularly important role as facilitators for discussion and reaching mutual understanding. And that's what I thought about that. Yeah. That's very uh, relevant. Uh, and finally, I've asked all the other panelists to <laughs> talk about whether there are obstacles. What is it that may hinder the realization of sustainable activities in the Arctic? What is your view? Um, one of the main challenges I have learned about after coming here to Boda on exchange is that the Arctic is experiencing a shortage of people with needed competitions, just as uh, the other panelists has mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that to attract more people to the Arctic region is very important and essential to build a strong and resilient communi community mm -hmm. with green and the innovative technology in large urban areas and the cities, but let's not forget about the rural areas. I think when the cities become larger, it will bring more positive effects to the surrounding rural areas, and then it will again boost more business development in the region and in the whole Arctic. And uh, that's uh, kind of thought about that. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you very much. Give her a big hand. <laughs> So thank you very much. I would like to pick up on your point on uh, people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it as well, Matt, so I'll turn to you. You um, identified infrastructure investment and people as issues. So uh, with your take, with uh, member companies in Arctic Economic Council, what, is the, what are the takeaways from the discussions you have on accessing the right competencies and, and enough people? I mean, the question is really, you know, how do we attract more and how do we avoid cannibalization from our neighboring towns in the north? Mm -hmm. Because that's a tendency. And I think the Arctic Economic Council, we got companies from 11 different countries. Notice that it's not eight. It's not the eight Arctic states. Because we are saying, no, we need to work with people from outside the Arctic. So as we heard earlier today, you know, there's a lot of 
unemployed people in Spain or Italy, or there's a lot of people in China and India that might be interested in working in the north. So we need to attract people from everywhere. Um, and then also we need to offer something more than just one job and one house. Um, people mm -hmm. move to the north because of they have opportunities to change jobs. No one is staying in the same job all the time. They move there because they can buy a bigger and bigger house each year and they might need another partner at some point. So we need to offer a lot of opportunities for people in the north because for many years we've just been talking about the nature. That's why people are moving up north. But that's not, it's not enough anymore. You know, we, we got all the adventurers. We got all the people that like skiing. Now we need to get all the people that wants to work in energy, who wants to work in fishing, who wants to work with smart cities. <laughs> all of these people, we need to get them as well. So it, it's a massive challenge. And what is interesting, just finally, and if you look across the Arctic, it's a common challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not from North Norway. This is across the Arctic region. And it's also a global challenge. So we, we are competing globally. And I think that's important to remember as well, that we are not like a unique case that please mm -hmm. just come. We need to have a better selling point than just that we are the Arctic. So I like the catchphrase. Uh, we already uh, managed to recruit the ones who like skiing. How do we recruit the ones that don't like skiing to come to the high north? And I turn to you, Knut Veda, because Mats mentioned energy, and you are a behemoth in energy, and you have um, a lot of expectations uh, facing Equinor. And of course, you have a lot of muscle uh, to address it. You mentioned uh, electrification, which has become a tough issue in Norway and in Hammerfest because you are straddling uh, oil and gas and uh, into renewables, as you said in your presentation. And you, I think one of your first sentences was that the transformation that Equinor goes through. Um, what does that mean to transform a company and deliver a dividend every quarter and nevertheless? I, don't, I think it, it, it's, uh, as you said, it's a... Um, it's a, it's a tough one uh, when you should, uh, the assets they're built for uh, providing their own power and then we should connect to grids and find other solutions to, uh, to take part in the transition. And then you have, to, you have to have the skilled workforce, but you also have the, the capital in order to, to do so. But that, uh, that, that's the thing we are in hand of. But the main challenge is, uh, as also Guru touched upon, it's, it's the infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that it's put in place, but also that we have a tendency to discuss the power equation both <laughs> just from um, the demand side, but we have to also to address uh, the supply side more, I think. Because the, that's the key thing, we need to supply more power in order to do so. Because we have to think of both the new, the existing industry, and that not uh, just oil and gas, but the fisheries and all other industries we have, because all have to go through the green transition. We're just starting it. Uh, so all have to do so. And then it's also uh, to uh, secure that it's enough power also for uh, the new industries that are coming. So that is kind of the, the equation we have to, to solve. So I'd like to turn to you, Jan Arven. I'll come to you after Tara because there's a link here. And the issue is that we heard in a previous session that business really is reliant upon attracting capital. And uh, you heard Tara, Tara talk about patient capital. Now, we know that a lot of capital is far from patient. So uh, you have a billion startup, uh, basically. And um, you talk about deglobalization. De You're a pure play, uh, renewable or, or um, energy transition company. Talk to us about capital a little bit. Yeah, that would be a, could be a long uh, speech. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, I think the key message that we have now is obviously we have raised risk capital. Uh, we have been into the most efficient capital market in the whole world, in the US. That's why we are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Our shareholders in the US, they obviously are start asking, with the latest development in the US, with the Inflation Reduction Act, why do you continue to spend money in Norway? And why can't you now start focusing on the po possibilities that you have in the US? And obviously, when we have a location close to Atlanta in Georgia, 
uh, which is uh, it's a slightly better space actually, and it's uh, very very well located. Obviously, we see that we are a startup, but we also have shareholders, and we are on the stock uh, on the stock exchange. So obviously, we have to listen to what the capital is asking, and that's why obviously we are extremely eager now to follow the development of the Norwegian and the European reaction to this uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, we are obviously uh, hoping that uh, this will also give us a, a sort of, and again, we are talk, not to go talking about subsidies, we are talking about the startup taking, reducing the risk during the startup phase. That's really what we are talking about. And I think all these type of industries are exposed to exactly that. And I think both Europe, and in particular uh, what we have been seeing lately, we see that there is a strong traction. So obviously, the revised national budget is what we are hoping for. So I see a link to what Jan Arve is talking about and what you're talking about, Tara, because um, capital is um, not blind. <laughs> capital sees what is going on around it. It sees the requirements to ESG, which helps you, Jan Arve. Uh, we see the policy that we want to have shorter supply lines that you talked about, and you talked about patient capital. Are there any trends, do you think, in that regard, <coughs> ESG, short supply lines, that can support and make a positive differentiator to providing business capital to Arctic communities? Well, you have uh, different regimes where uh, in the US you're the ESG components are not necessarily regulated. Uh, there, I think you're seeing more movement in that direction. Uh, but when, when I talk about patient capital and the need to drive behavior, what I'm really questioning is whether or not we, ha we are considering the right components in addition to the financial returns uh, for driving that investment to the Arctic. And because we have remote uh, geographic communities that are, that are uh, there's so much expanse in between, uh, and it's challenging with short construction seasons uh, and small population centers in these very rural areas, those typically are inhibitors to making a business case for investment in the Arctic. And what I am so thankful that there are so many scholars in the room and financial experts, I'm challenging the group to turn that uh, formula on its head and is there a way for us to create our own Arctic investment formula that drives positive, those what are typically seen as negative drivers into positive weighted components so that when companies are looking to invest in the Arctic, they receive more social license for investing in an extremely remote area, let's say in broadband, uh, to create those smarter cities, but uh, to make sure that our communities are not only connected through the road system or th through uh, boating and maritime waterways or through air travel, but also through uh, broadband uh, connectivity. And so that's what I'm saying. When I, when I talk about patient capital and kind of turning things on their head so that we look at it differently, Mm -hmm. Just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it's going to work for tomorrow. So I note the fact that you talked in your intervention about the metrics of doing this better. And I think it's well worth uh, noting that you don't need to, do, to start from scratch. Your intervention, Teresa, also demonstrated we know how to do this quite well if we tap into the relevant sources. Uh, you mentioned to me earlier the guidelines for environmental impact assessment in the Arctic. That's created quite a lot of positive feedback. And people don't tap into it as much as they could. And I wanted to uh, turn briefly to you, Teresa, to ask you, um, you seem to be operating in a way that works. Could you tell me how tough do you have to be when you're a benefit manager? Do you have to be really bad and crack the whip, or does it create its own logic when it's there? 
it's you don't ha you do have to be tough, but not in a confrontational way. Mm -hmm. If you have issues, work through them with the company. You develop confidence. You develop respect. It doesn't always. It's not always positive. It's not always negative. So listen to each other. Talk to each other. Consult meaningfully, and it works that way. It doesn't work if one side is telling the other side what has to be done. It works when you both work together for creative solutions. Monica. Sure. I Go ahead. I just want to point out the models that are used in Alaska and northern Canada with respect to resource development are models that really uh, can benefit other groups mm -hmm. across the Arctic. And uh, we have kind of, I would say, walked that trail to uh, negotiate very creative agreements uh, for our communities and for the benefit of our, uh, I would say, our villages, our regions, and our people uh, with the mindset that we are the aboriginal environmentalists uh, yes. from the Arctic. And uh, our identity is tied to the land and to the animals and to the resources. And so we're working every day to strike that balance. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from uh, the, the work that has been done, so without having to recreate the wheel. Exactly, so that's the point. And it really brings me to you, Guru, because um, you dis describe a tough situation in Rongokoft and uh, East Finnmark, and you pointed to lack of grid capacity as a key issue, and also um, uh, high taxes, low prices to compress it. But you did not, interestingly enough, say that local license to operate was your, on your top three list. Uh, so, uh, of course, in Norway, there's quite a lot of tension related to the wind farm issue and Supreme Court judgment on a violation of human rights uh, with regard to indigenous peoples in Norway. But I know that you've told us that in Finnmark and in East Finnmark, there have been quite a healthy coexistence. Would you like to share? Yes, uh, Varanger Craft have been realizing projects that have had a, a very good cooperation with, uh, with the Sami uh, and the reindeer, reindeer herders. Um, and, but I think in our dialogue with the reindeer herders, they are point painting some important things that we have to, to, be, to, to practice better. And that is their capacity and their competence to, to actually follow up on their legal rights mm. in, the, in the dialogue with a power company or other interests that want to, to, to develop um, business in, the, in their areas. So they are, in a, they are pressured by many different interests, not only uh, energy production, but many different interests. So I think we have to, to, uh, to be a professional partner in, in, in give them more possibilities in to, to, high, to, to, get, to um, develop their competence, but also to give them more capacity uh, in, uh, in uh, the dialogue with the uh, different partners. That's a very relevant point. I'm try, I will try to do, and I was inspired by you, Jan Arbe, because you sort of made a, um, a wish for what you would like to see in the budget or from the government in yeah. Norway, right? <laughs> so I would actually ask you, because you're all looking into the future, and I appreciate that uh, from all of you. So that means you want something uh, that is not there. You want an improvement or you want something to happen. So although it's an easy so-called list of posting to yourself, if you could decide what was on the front page of the news in the week, on the, on the newspaper and on, on, on the screen, what news would you welcome? As a politician, you know that it's the 12th of, uh, the, of, of May, which is going to be the date when they are submitting the revised national budget. No, I think that uh, the, I, I will pick up on the, what the Prime Minister actually said. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is a need for, for, I think, for the politicians to actually put, put actions to what they have promised, because there is a link between the demand to try to reduce the uh, energy or the, the temperature increase, mm -hmm. and uh, that will cost, that will cost uh, a, a number of of, uh, of, of support. So, so I, my wish uh, yeah. is that there is decision, a decision in the parliament which is lasting then more than only to the next election, yeah. that they will support and, and uh, the transition of the energy. Okay, so try to sum up. The headline you want is we're almost matching the Inflation Reduction Act. 
that would do you. So what headline would you like? And uh, you can pick any paper, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what would you like to see as the big break, breaking news? Well, what we need now is uh, predictability. And uh, so we need to have mm -hmm. decisions made uh, that we have uh, predictability to present to, 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 to the, um, the businesses that want to develop in, in, in the Finnmark and in the eastern part of Finnmark. There has to be made some decisions that we, that we know and that we can actually plan for. Uh, when will we have the grid capacity necessary to, to realize the ammonium production in mm -hmm. Malavog, for example, that mm -hmm. also the Prime Minister mentioned today. So, so we, there needs to be made some decision in what, uh, and, uh, in what kind of, um, that gives the, the, the businesses the more predictability for the development. So the headline will be, now you know, if you want to start a business in Finnmark, you'll get the power you need at the right if time. If I could really wish, then I would say that we would have the grid capacity, necess the necessary the grid capacity in uh, 2027 at latest. Then we would Very be nice, happy. like that. Tara, what headline would you like? Well, I would like for Arne home to write the headline. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's always helpful. But he needs uh, material. Yes, you know? yeah, that it would be that the Arctic parliamentarians have come together to agree on a framework for climate and economic policy throughout the Arctic. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think okay. it's. I, I think the most important part. We, we have a tendency to talk in the Arctic family with the Arctic family, and we need the headline. Really needs to be, you know, on the New York Times or the Washington Post that policymaker realized the Arctic is not just polar bears. You know that there are people <laughs> living here. There were the thriving communities here, and there's a lot of opportunities here. But it's it's a hard challenge. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So that people realize there's people living here and therefore investing in the people living here. I like it. Breaking news: there are people in the Arctic. Knutvida, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. No, I think I definitely agree to the previous uh, speakers, both on the on the frameworks and uh, and what uh, what we could look uh, to see. But uh, not to repeat, I think. Uh, one of the headlines that will really be beneficial for all of us is that maybe Northern Norway has agreed on the prioritizations related to the green shifts and grid, and that we are kind of saying that, okay, we need to go step by step. These are the steps. Because then I think it will be more easy for us in order to achieve it. And, but that is kind of a, a tough task. But I think that is what's needed in order to achieve a sustainable future for, for the northern Norway and Arctic. So the headline is, we have a plan. Yeah, I think so. OK. <laughs> Teresa. I think mine would be that climate change has been slowed down, and it's no longer affecting the Arctic North and affecting our daily lives. Mm, thank you. Do you have a wish for the Arctic? <laughs> um, as a student, actually, for my headline, what I want to see is that the Arctic wants you to join in. And the, uh, such headline will just appear in my like social media or something. Just I open my t smartphone, mm -hmm. yeah. and I can just uh, have a look at this. And I will be very eager to join that, because you know, Arctic is uh, fascinating and promising regions and the, all the young people like uh, not only me and all the uh, younger generations from all over the world they all want to work for it and want to uh, contribute to it so I see for my my highlight will be Arctic wants you to join in let's click it now <laughs> <laughs> lovely a big hand to the panel thank you you did great <laughs>